And what, what about marriage itself? Do the, does the fact that women still have to be domiciled with their husbands, that their citizenship follows their husbands, does that continue? The old law that said the husband, the domicile statute is very standard. The husband is the head of the household. He will decide where the household lives. It was part of the Oklahoma territorial law. It carried perfectly word for word into Oklahoma state law. And in 19, in the early 1980s, um, two members of the Oklahoma legislature fell in love and they got married. And that was very lovely, except that if she, if lost her domicile in her district, she could no longer represent her district. So you would think, right, that it would be erased overnight, but it wasn't. People got up in the Oklahoma legislature and said God had intended, and it was debated three successive sessions of the Oklahoma legislature, and it was not erased until 1988. There's a similar but not quite so long history of married women uh, being unable to retain their birth names. And in the 1960s, I think, there was a similar case of a woman who was a legislator in some place in Louisiana, and she married, and she wanted to keep the name under which she had been elected, and the state law said no. Um, in Louisiana, in fact, as late as, I think the 1950s, we talked about the husband having access to the body of his wife. There was a woman who sought a divorce on the basis that her husband was demanding too much sex of her, you know, several times every night, all the time. And that was rejected by the courts as not a good uh, cause for claiming a divorce. So many elements of coverture and the practices of coverture continued to percolate in our laws and they had to be eliminated state by state one after another. One major one was jury service, was holding office. So, um, and you, one would think, because the practice for men was, in fact, men serve on juries even before they actually vote, because it's an old English practice that a jury is drawn from the neighborhood in which the crime is committed, and not necessarily people who can vote. By 1920, when women get the vote, they assume that since they're electors, they should be able to vote. And in fact, in about a third of the states, that is so. But even in those states, the first guy who is found guilty by a jury that has women on it questions his conviction on the grounds that he was not tried by 12 good men and true. Mm -hmm. And the court has to go back and say, no, 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 it doesn't say 12 good men and true in the Constitution. It says a jury drawn from the neighborhood in which the crime, an impartial jury. Right. Uh, and, and that's all you're entitled to. But in many other states, including New York, uh, the judges said, oh yeah, I guess that's that's so, or the court, the, the law had been written in terms of electors originally. And for those, you had to go back and get a constitutional change in the state constitution or in the state statute. So women do not serve on juries in New York until 1938. And when they are eligible for jury service, when you're called for jury service, you get a little form and it's got checklist and you can check your automatic exemptions for jury service and the first one if I remember correctly is a ship captain who is actually often at sea right. and the second one I think is a fireman who it could be on duty and it goes on like that and number eight is a woman oh. a woman right you can just not check. you mean not a woman with small children no, 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 just no. any any a woman, woman. 
you can just check. Because I'm you're a woman. I'm a woman. Your I'm household husband. duties. And the justification when people talked about this was, um, uh, Oh, she would be shocked by what she hears in court. She might be shocked by what she has to discuss in the jury room. She would be shut up in a jury room with men and women. Uh, there's a wonderful point where Eleanor Roosevelt says, well, we share a bathroom with men on airplanes. <laughs> What's the problem? When Massachusetts finally allows women on juries in 1949, they have an exception if they might be horrified by what they, what they see and what hear they see in, and in a jury room. Fascinating. It's fascinating. Yeah. And so each of those places requires not only another political struggle to claim jury service, but also a political struggle after they're allowed on juries, but or required to serve on juries, but with constraints. There's an old line about an American citizen is a person who believes in jury service until such time as they are called upon to serve. To serve. <laughs> uh, which is a setting in which very few people recognize that it's both the obligation of the citizen, but it is also the right of the defendant to have a jury that is drawn from an impartial, drawn impartially from the neighborhood, the whole community in which the crime was committed. And if it's not that women defendants are entitled to have women on juries, on their jury, no one has a right, right to a sociological clone. But if you on exclude your jury, women completely, you, that's right. Then that's right. And you if you deprive them, and there were wonderful handbooks for lawyers saying, if you are choose, involved in choosing juries, tell you the people you don't want. You don't want ministers because they're too sympathetic to the defendant. You don't want women because they're too sympathetic to the you defendant. You certainly don't want kindergarten teachers. Right. Right. Um, and so each of these pieces had to be pulled aside.